my student loans. Uh, in 2003, after five years of practicing law, uh, the chief judge of this state awarded me as one of the top pro bono attorneys for my work defending tenants on the precipice of eviction through the Legal Aid Society's housing division. In 2005, I said I was gonna run for the city council and I did. The Democratic Party told me it wasn't my turn. I ran anyways, but they showed me. I lost by 3,000 votes, but I kept going and I didn't give up. After that loss in my primary in 2005, I started a, a, a legal practice with on the east side with eviction intervention services, representing hundreds of tenants who couldn't afford representation. In 2011, I was elected to the legislature and I've been a leader in Albany on decarceration, on reform, uh, on a whole host of issues that I look forward to talking about during the course of this debate in the campaign over the next seven months. That's what I bring to the table as district attorney. And I talked a little bit about in my last answer, exactly what my vision is and how I would go about changing the office. Thank you very much. Diane, would you give us your opening statement? Thank you so much, <laughs> Diana, that's fine. Hi, I'm Diana Florence and I'm running for Manhattan DA to fight for the people who never thought they'd win. It's something I've done my entire life. Starting uh, when I was a child, I'm the sister of a profoundly autistic brother named David and David doesn't speak. And so I learned very early on to use my voice to speak for both of us, for, to advocate for both of us. And that's what I continue to do in my career at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. I brought cases that involved crimes of power and not crimes of poverty. I went after companies that put profits before people. I went after big real estate landlords, slumlords like Donald Trump. I didn't go after Donald Trump and nor did the, the current DA, but I did go after uh, real estate uh, interest who uh, kicked out tenants and uh, stole from NYCHA tenants. And you know, think about Donald Trump for a second in our current DA and imagine what our world would have been like if the current DA had done his job and actually had done crimes of power in the way I pursued it when I was the chief of the construction fraud task force. Not only would we have been spared the last four years of horror, you know, we would have had a more just New York. And that's why the, the current DA is failed and why it's so important who your next DA is. The main focus of the DA, in my opinion, is to go after corruption because there is an interconnection between corruption and the rest of the problems we face. I am so proud to be supported by 12 labor unions, everyday New Yorkers okay. like bus drivers. And at 30. Okay, thank you very much, Lucy. Would you unmute and thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvia, and thank you CRDC and HK Dems for convening this important conversation. As a national criminal justice reform leader and a former assistant district attorney here in Manhattan, I know that the role of the district attorney encompasses far more than prosecution alone. It requires working with and collaborating with all of Manhattan's communities. It requires prioritizing prevention and rehabilitation and public health approaches. The next district attorney has to take a 360 degree view of everyone the system touches. That includes victims, incarcerated people, their families and children, and the communities that we all live in. That is why I created a first of its kind college and prison course that brought assistant district attorneys into prisons to learn alongside incarcerated students and to understand the impacts of the decision they're making every day. It's also why I've been a leading voice in restoring the right to vote to people who are incarcerated while they're incarcerated. Imagine if all of us in this forum had to go inside of prisons in order to persuade the people there that we deserve their vote. It's also why I'm proud to say that I have been endorsed by mothers who lost loved ones to police violence, including Valerie Bell, Valerie Castile, and Victoria Davis, and why I'm proud to have been endorsed by Weinstein survivors and silence breakers. I know how to transform the system because I have worked to reform it from inside and from outside. I am running to realize the full potential of what the district attorney can be prioritizing prevention and healing, upholding racial and gender equity, and promoting the dignity of all New Yorkers. Um, that was good. Right on the nose. Te uh, Tehani. 
Thank Getting you. there, Sylvia. I'll get there by the end of the night. I'll have somebody's <laughs> name right. You'll, you'll get there. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tahani Abushi, and I am a civil rights attorney running to be Manhattan District Attorney. And I'm running to transform this office away from a place that destabilizes and destroys our families to one that invests in our communities and makes sure that we have what we need to actually address the root causes of crimes while also ensuring a safe and just society for everyone. Now this fight for criminal justice reform is personal to me because when I was 14, my father was sentenced to 22 years in prison. And overnight, my mother became a single parent of 10 children. And we struggled in ways that are unimaginable from access to education, housing stability, financial stability, and making sure that we didn't let this system throw our family away. And so for the last 10 years, I served as a civil rights attorney fighting against discrimination, racism, police violence, and representing victims of sexual assaults. Through my work, I've been able to actually change policies within departments in this city that not only keep us safe, but also hold these systems of authority accountable. And that's what I plan to do with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. I plan to make this place transparent, accountable, and collaborative with those who are most impacted by it. And that means ensuring that we center black and brown communities and we give victims a voices, give victim voices instead of drowning it out in place of our ego. It's going to take somebody from the impacted community, those closest to the problem, to finally be, finally be closest to the power I'm, to actually make the change. Thank, thank you. you. Liz? You have to unmute. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, as a member of the CDRC, it's, 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 a, it's a great honor to be in front of you guys. And thanks to the HK Dems. I've entered the race and I'm running to be the next Manhattan District Attorney because I am a 20 year practitioner. What does that mean? That means close to 4,000 cases that I've done. Close to 3,000 of those are as a defense attorney. I have represented everyone from soup to nuts and all different kinds of people in all different places and in all different crimes, state and federal. I, the remaining of which of the cases I've represented was as an assistant DA in Manhattan, and I was there for six years. I think that this is my experience, and this experience brings an informed perspective to lead this office. We need to bring realistic, common sense reforms to the district attorney's office that builds community trust and makes victims feel protected. This is done through thoughtful and a measured approach and it's based on looking at each and every case. And the job of the district attorney is to enforce the laws of the state of New York. That is what I'm running to do. And that is what I will do when, when I got elected. Thanks so much. Thank you, Eliza. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. I'm Eliza Orleans and I'm the only public defender running for Manhattan district attorney. In the more than a decade that I've spent going up against Cy Vance's office in court, I've represented over 3,000 people charged with crimes and as many as 180 cases at any given time. For every case I've worked on, I've had to manage countless moving parts from making strategic decisions and interviewing witnesses to leading teams of investigators, social workers, and experts without ever losing sight of the unique stories, circumstances, and human beings at the heart of each case. I know the system inside and out. I know that it's rigged for the rich and powerful and against everyone else. And I've fought this DA's office every day of my career. So I know that defeating Cy Vance is just the first step, then the real work starts. And just like in my job as a public defender, there's no room for error when you are DA because lives are at stake. To change the system, we have to change the DA, but we have to get that choice right. If we want to make real meaningful change, we need the next Manhattan DA to be someone who will fight, someone who brings a real sense of urgency, who understands what's at stake. Simply having a vision for changing the office, even if it's progressive, isn't enough. The next DA needs to be ready to lead, put plans in place, and make changes from day one. That's what I'm ready to do. So I'm look for, looking forward to hearing your questions and having this conversation tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Alvin. Good evening. Thanks for having me. When I was 15 years old growing up in Harlem, I was stopped in my corner at gunpoint by the NYPD. A gun put it inches from my face. That was the first of many stops. 
three at gunpoint. I also had a gun pointed at me three times by people who were not police officers growing up in Harlem. These early experiences are why I went to law school and why I've been fighting for justice for the past 20 years. I left Harlem, went to Harvard and came back to Harlem and got right back to work. Started off as a criminal defense lawyer and a civil rights lawyer. Then I became a federal prosecutor focused on public corruption. And ultimately I became the chief deputy attorney general of New York state overseeing a staff of 1200. We did hold Trump accountable. We sued him and held him accountable for his misconduct with the Trump Foundation. We sued Harvey Weinstein for having a hostile work environment. We stood up for tenants who were harassed out of their homes by landlords. We prosecuted employers who cheated workers out of their wages. And we stood side by side with survivors of violent offenses. All of this work is personal for me. I have bailed out a loved one. I have navigated the effects of mass incarceration for many friends and family members. And just the other day, yet again, I talk with my children about how to navigate safely a police encounter. This is my life. This is my life's work. I stand ready to bring all of these experiences to bear to fundamentally reform the Manhattan DA's office. Thank you. Thank you. Charlie. Thank you, CRDC and HK Dem, Sylvia and Mark, for having me. I want to introduce myself to your members as an immigrant, because that's fundamentally who I am. I came to this country as a young girl from Iran to flee the violence, the instability, and the religious persecution that my family was experiencing there. And that remains my framework for how I see the world as an immigrant for two reasons, Sylvia. First, I never take for granted the things that my parents brought me to this country to experience, fairness and safety. And second, when I see barriers to access, barriers to opportunity, even if they're not ones that I've experienced myself, I want to tear them down because I know what it's like to stand on the other side of a barrier or of a border. And I've built my life, my career around these principles. I've worked across American legal institutions from the Supreme Court to uh, the leadership of the Department of Justice in the Obama administration, to federal prosecution, and then to the leadership team of the Brooklyn DA's office, where I was the general counsel and where we built a national model of progressive prosecution while remaining committed to the mission of the office, which is public safety for the most vulnerable among us. And I draw on those values that experience, and particularly those leadership experiences in my vision for the Manhattan DA's office. Thank you. Thank you. Janos. I grew up on the west side in a rent-controlled apartment with an immigrant mother and two brothers. And I had access to great education, but I also grew up a young man of color in Rudy Giuliani's New York. That meant being stopped and frisked, harassed by police, arrested and even jailed, all in the name of cleaning up our streets. And now that our city is going through another tough time, let's be clear, police and prisons are not gonna be the answer to our problems. My name is Janos Martin, and I'm running for Manhattan District Attorney with a new vision for justice, one that invests in people and communities and helps people get their lives back on track. We've been so fortunate on the West Side to see how much growth we've had in the last 20 years, but COVID has revealed the horrible truth of who we've left behind. People struggling with mental illness, people struggling with homelessness, and young people with no hope. I've spent my career fighting with and for those people. As a young civil rights lawyer with Norman Siegel, taking on the NYPD and fighting for the First Amendment. At the Moreland Commission, investigating public corruption. I led the campaign to close Rikers Island, organizing with formerly incarcerated people to shutter a notorious jail. At the ACLU, I ran a national program, passing criminal justice reform legislation across the country. And those are the values I'm bringing to Manhattan DA's office. Ending the war on drugs and treating addiction like a public health issue, investing in community-based mental health care, and taking on Wall Street, political corruption, and employers who steal from their workers. I've spent my life standing up to power and standing up for, for people. A new vision for justice is needed in Manhattan. Thank you. Now we're going to start, continue with the round of questions with Diana. Um, please describe how you envision the district attorney's office and how you would run it if given the great possibility, if given that opportunity, given the possibility of budgetary restraints. Thanks so much. So the Manhattan District Attorney's Office has not changed in 45 years. Morgenthau came in in 1975 and did a wholesale restructure and it hasn't changed. 
it needs to be done so. We cannot be um, operating as if it's the 21st, it's the 20th century. What we need to be doing is re reallocating the resources away from crimes of poverty and, uh, and, uh, and towards crimes of power. Crimes of power are things like domestic violence, sexual assault. I have a plan on my, on my um, website that deals with those types of crimes, believing victims, shattering the myth of the perfect victim, and also white collar crime. I spent my career almost 20 of my 25 years prosecuting white collar crime. What I can tell you is when you, when you go after the top levels, not only do you get justice for those uh, in that case, for example, a $6 million wage theft case I personally brought, but you also send messages to that industry and you refill our tax coffers. Those are monies that can go to programs that will help our schools, that will help kids get away from gang violence and all sorts of other social services. The district attorney's office can be that change maker. It can be a place of opportunity and not obstacle. We can also go, uh, proactively go after crime and fraud in housing. That is something that has lived in the, in, in the real estate world. It has lived in housing court. And it, right now the burden is on tenants. Time. And Thank you, Diana. Lucy, what are the most significant changes that you believe should be made in Cy Vance's Cy Vance office? I see a three-tiered approach, and there are a number of plans on my website, BoatLucyLine.com, that I encourage people to look to for more detail. But the first is building an inclusive workforce. That means prioritizing diversity and inclusion in hiring and in retention. It means mission aligned training and communications within the office, not just training lawyers about the law, but training them about the philosophy of the office, the importance of solving mass incarceration in our lifetime, which we can do. And it includes building an inclusive workforce culture in which diverse voices that represent the whole diversity of New York City are heard and are a part of the office. So I would completely overhaul the evaluation and promotion process for internal staff. I would prioritize mental health for staff to ensure that they're able to do their job effectively. I would include uh, training that's focused on cultural humility and implicit bias and other things like procedural justice that we know will improve outcomes for everyone. And I would require that the staff be treated inclusively by all the related agencies, including the police department, and that the police department is called out for misconduct by staff and externally. The second is around metrics. I would change the metrics by which we evaluate all assistants in the district attorney's office to prioritize their relationships with victims, their use of alternatives to incarceration, the consideration of collateral consequences, and the amount of their community engagement. And finally, I would seek to really overhaul the office from a racial justice perspective. And I refer people to my website to see the step-by-step -step way in which I think the district attorney's office needs to recognize and repair racial injustice, shrink the system, and integrate anti-racist policies, support communities, in particular communities of color, and create an inclusive workplace culture in which people feel comfortable reporting and proceeding when they've been victimized. Thank you. Tahani, what policy and procedural reforms do you plan to implement if, if you become the district attorney? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Sylvia. That's a great question. And what I'm hearing is, uh, directing these questions at what Vance has done. This problem is not with Vance. Vance is just another cut and paste prosecutor that has followed in a lineage of prosecutors who have used fear mongering to prosecute and target communities of color uh, as scapegoats for the powerful and privileged that commit crimes with impunity. The first thing I will do and everything I will do will be towards shrinking the footprint of this office. And the way to do that is to start by creating an actual collaborative body of advisors that are first and foremost impacted community members, uh, including victims and accused alike, uh, community leaders, and those from multidisciplinary professional backgrounds. Because what we're talking about here is not crime and punishment, it's public health. The people that are impacted by the system, they're family members, they are parents, like mine were, they are kids, siblings, um, and members of our community. And so what we first need to do is not only create that collaborative body, but to focus on this almost billion dollar budget 
Where is the money going? A lot of it came from these communities of color and we have yet to invest them back in these communities. And so I would create, use this body to go through the community-based programs and actually partner and invest in them to address root causes of crimes for permanent solutions. And the second thing I would do is also create, uh, go back to our early case assessment bureau, where that is the brain room where district attorneys decide whether to charge, what to charge, and what penalty, if any, would be recommended. Time. And, and that Thank is you. the place where we can make the most impact. Thank you. Liz, do you see a need to modernize the practices and or the culture of the DA's office? And if so, in what respect would you be, what would be your first order of business? Well, I think the, pra thanks for the question. I think the practice of the DA's office has gotten entirely wrong. I think we can do better. Here are some day one changes that I would make. What the district attorney does on a routine basis is use certificates of readiness. While this sounds like a little bit of inside baseball, what it does is it prolongs cases to be nine months, a year, a year and a half. They should stop using bogus certificates of readiness, which I think are minor, are, are ethical infractions on a minor scale, not on a major scale. But how do we know that they're actually ready? This prolongs the cases. Justice delayed is justice denied. That practice has to end. I also think the district attorney's office, while I feel very strongly about victims and victims' rights and victims need to have a voice, I've had a plan of, you know, right now, uh, district uh, ADAs who are in sex crimes unit or domestic violence unit work in all different kinds of street crime. I think people who work in sex crime and domestic violence should only work in those areas, then they are trained properly in those areas, and that we use the the office to help victims. But I think in doing that, we also have to know that they are using orders of protection as a, sh as a sword sometimes and not a shield. They sometimes issue orders of protection without looking into what it means to the defendant's work, home, job, and what their situation is. It's blanket order of protection, stay away. This affects families and ways to make income. I think these have to be addressed. Also too, I think that you have to look at the mental health. Um, thank you, Liz. Um, Eliza, Eliza, what do you expect to be your priorities with respect to prosecution? Well, that's a great question. And I think that, you know, as someone who spent over a decade as a public defender in Manhattan, I think back to a case that I handled when I was a first year public defender 11 years ago. A client of mine was a um, gentleman who worked at a Gristides in Lower Manhattan, the same grocery store he'd worked at for his entire career. And he'd made his way up to assistant manager. And one night he was closing up the store. He bought two bags of groceries with his employee discount and walked over to the A train to head home uptown. He set his groceries on the seats next to him on the uncrowded subway car and got ready for his long ride home. At the 125th Street stop, two uniformed NYPD officers got on the train, grabbed his groceries, dumped them to the ground, placed him in handcuffs, and took him to jail for the night for the crime of occupying multiple seats on a transit facility. That's an example of just one of many of the thousands of cases that I've represented people on where I don't think we should be prosecuting cases like that. And clients of mine get arrested for things like stealing a pint of ice cream worth $4.99 from a Dwayne Reed. And meanwhile, there are people who are committing wage theft to the tune of millions or tens of millions of dollars and not being held accountable. You know, we, we've we seen uh, lots of rich, powerful, well-connected um, people not be held accountable. And I certainly will do the opposite. Thank you, Eliza. Um, I want to remind people not to use the chat because it becomes very distracting. Um, the next is Alvin. Um, Alvin, what are, you, what are your views on the sentencing laws and where do you think they are too strict or too lenient? Well, the, we have a system that is overly punitive uh, and it's overly punitive in the neighborhoods that I know well, in Harlem where I grew up uh, and where I'm supported by, by much of the leadership uh, here. And side by side with that, we have a system that does not hold accountable people like Trump, people like Harvey Weinstein, people like Jeffrey Epstein. So we need to look at this system side by side, these two systems of justice, and we need to have a fair application of the law. 
And it isn't just what the law is, it is who is enforcing it. So I spent 20 plus years in the courtroom fighting for fair and just sentences and outcomes and equally applying the law. So yes, we can talk about how to reform sentencing laws and we should, we should be having uh, assistant district attorneys uh, fight for um, sentences that are fair and just and starting with the default at the low end of, of the sentencing range. But we also need to be looking much more holistically at communities and the people and issues like reentry and places where people are coming back to. So we need to draw and not look just myopically at the law that, by the way, the district attorney cannot change, but how we can execute it. And that's what I've been doing for 20 plus years, looking at people who come in front of us as old people, as members of communities, as members of community that I've been a part of for my entire life. Thank you. Tali, can you tell us your views on the prosecution of sex crimes? Yes, uh, thank you, Sylvia. That's a great question. Uh, so one of my ambitions for the Manhattan DA's office is to create a new bureau of gender-based violence, which would house sex crimes, domestic violence, sex trafficking, cyber abuse that is gender targeted, hate crimes based on gender. And uh, I give you the full range of all of those different crimes, not just sex crimes, Sylvia, because I think it's important to start by saying that Crimes against women in particular and gender-based violence more generally has not gotten the attention that it deserves. Only half of these crimes are even reported in the first instance. And when they are reported, they are under-prosecuted and there's widespread victim dissatisfaction. And I think that all of these have to be taken together they have to become a first priority for the district attorney. This bureau would answer directly to me in the Manhattan DA's office. And it would require extensive retraining and moral courage and commitment to bringing these prosecutions. And one of its guiding principles of this bureau, Sylvia, and this is particularly relevant to sex crimes, would be to have a practice that is victim-centered and offender-focused, which means the focus of the investigation is on the offender, not on the victim in the first instance. Thank you. Janos, what is your position on prosecuting offenders who are struggling with addiction and, and or mental disorders? Well, thank you so much for that important question. And for all of us who live in Hell's Kitchen, we, we see it every day. This is a crisis in our city. Just the other day, we released our mental health policy paper. It was our ninth policy that we released more than any other candidate. And what it focuses on is how we can get resources into community-based mental health care. When somebody has come into the criminal courtroom and is often very late in the process and we're really just applying bandages. So the first thing we need to do is use resources from the financial forfeiture fund. I propose 50 million a year for the next four years to go to community-based mental health care. That'll be delivery outside the DA's office. Number two, we have to change the way mental health care courts work. Right now in Cy Vance's office, people who need mental health court aren't allowed in, supervisors put up obstacles. Uh, and then the people who are allowed in are probably the people who need the least help, who need to be least tangled in the criminal legal system. So we're gonna change our approach there. And we need to change the way we do emergency response when someone's in mental health crisis. And I've supported Jumani Williams' proposal to have a different emergency response than NYPD when people are undergoing a mental health crisis. Uh, so all of that points to a, a system that is much more compassionate, that recognizes that people struggling with mental illness uh, are humans who need to be supported. You know, uh, this is a personal issue for me. Uh, one of my relatives struggles with SMI, severe mental illness, and my uncle has worked in this space for his career. And I know that we can do much better in New York City than letting people struggle in the streets when they could be getting compassion care programs. Thank you. Dan. Do you believe there is a problem with jail overcrowding? And if so, how would you adjust your prosecution and sentence recommendation strategies to address this? And cash bail and sentencing reform. Um, I've been very clear, and this is legislation I wrote myself five years ago before it was easy or before it was uh, uh, known as a basic talking point amongst all Democrats running for office or district attorney and cash bail because the connection between one's wealth or lack of wealth and their liberty is unconstitutional, in my view, is immoral if not unconstitutional. So I would use the guideposts of the legislation I wrote five years ago. And that's been my effort in Albany uh, over my entire nine years uh, to reduce the carceral state and ending cash bail on day one 
is the way in which I'll begin to accomplish that. Secondly, sentencing reform. You look at other progressive prosecutors around the country, uh, Rachel Rollins in Boston, Larry Krasner in Philadelphia, they've all set forth specific sentencing changes, not a case by case analysis, not a, a hope for greater sensitivity by mainline ADAs, no, a rebuttable presumption that no one will be offered a sentence greater than 20 years. That's my promise of the policy I will implement. And that's the way we'll reduce jails, uh, state correctional facility sentences, as well as bail reform, which will reduce the funnel of those who we sent to our county jails. Thank you. Diana, what is your position on Second Amendment rights and gun control? I think it's very important that we have that we enforce our gun uh, our gun laws here in New York. We have the strictest ones in the country, and yet we have a rising gun program. Uh, we have a problem here, and that's because we're not attaching we're not attacking the problem at its source. My proposal involves doing an interstate uh, compact where we actually go along the iron pipeline. And we do similar to what I did when I was chief of the construction fraud task force. I organized multiple district attorneys all over the state to collaboratively go after that type of crime. So we need to do the same with guns because we have great laws, but we can't, if we're not enforcing them and we're not stopping the source, we're not doing anything. Thank you. Um, Lucy. How would you change the way police mi misconduct cases are handled? And what guidance would you provide the New York Police Department in this area? I'm really glad that you asked that question because I have spent the past several years working with families who lost loved ones to police violence with prosecutors and police chiefs who are seeking to solve these problems. And there is no question that police misconduct is a, a, a massive and under-acknowledged problem in our city and nationally. As of uh, next April, all of those cases will, all uh, fatality cases will go to the Attorney General's office and I commit to working hand in hand with the Attorney General in fully investigating and ensuring accountability in instances of fatality. But with respect to misconduct and lying, those are things that will simply not be tolerated under my administration as district attorney. And that's going to mean bulking out the catalog of officers who were found not to be credible by judges, but beyond that, tracking officers who use dehumanizing language, officers who make questionable decisions, officers who routinely bring in cases re reliant on what are deemed to be improper stops at the earliest stages of the case. All of those things need to be tracked, communicated within the office, and those officers must not be relied on in going forward with cases. That is a critical step towards ensuring accountability for police and towards healing the relationship between the district attorneys and the communities that we serve. Dahani, what is your view on police presence in schools? And do you feel that it feeds the school to prison pipeline? Thank you for that question, Sylvia. And this is one of the most important areas that we need to focus on is saving our youth, our young people from the clause, uh, the ever reaching clause of the prosecution system. I think we have a big problem relying on police uh, instead of using our social service programs uh, to give people resources. In my line of work, I not only represent children who are bullied, harassed, and sexually assaulted in schools, I also represent them in suspension hearings. These are full-blown trials where staff members are testifying against children. They're subject to cross-examination, the rules of evidence, and they get sentencing, expulsion, um, uh, kicked out of school, suspension, everything and anything that disrupts uh, their education and now puts them as a path as a bad kid that is gonna get kicked around in the system until they end up in, in the prosecution system. Police need to be out of our schools, out of our homeless shelters, shouldn't be responding to our mental health crises. We shouldn't be relying on police where public health should be placed. And that's what it means to shrink the footprint of this office. And instead of saying, we're gonna prosecute and then give help, say, no, we're gonna decline to prosecute, pass them along to the experts that know how to respond and stop criminalizing children, specifically children of color, for being just that children. 
And that is the only way we're going to allow them an opportunity to not only be themselves, but to grow up to who they want to be when without the prosecution system and the police uh, taking away every opportunity from them. Thank you. Liz, would you give any particular consideration to the collateral consequences that arise when a suspect or a defendant is an immigrant? Yes, I 100% would. Uh, you could get um, what happens when you uh, get arrested and you're an immigrant, it's called crimes of moral turpitude. And if you are found anything to have a crime of moral turpitude, that remains a basis for not getting re-entry. You can be denied re-entry into this country or use it as a basis of uh, deporting someone. I think that these are really terrible things to do to immigrants. I think it is having a huge effect on one's life, especially if uh, the immigrant has, was not born here, but has gone to school here and raised a family here. And that, that the person uh, to the pizza case, the guy in, in who they wanted to deport and who they put in ICE custody, I, the pizza guy case, I think that immigrants should be given every consideration. That said, I also think too, when it comes to violent crime, it doesn't matter where you're from. I think that if, if you are a violent crime, you should you should look at those things and you should look at what the end result of the crime was and what what crime was perpetrated. But I also think in collateral consequences on nonviolent cases, 100% that should be a consideration. Thank you. Eliza, if you could change anything in the latest bail reform legislation, what it, would it be? That's a fantastic question. And as a public defender, I saw far too often clients of mine getting held in on cash bail, um, being held simply because they couldn't afford to pay for their freedom. You know, we say we have a presumption of innocence in this country, but anyone who's practiced within the public defender's office certainly knows that that only applies when you are rich enough to buy your freedom. I've had clients as young as 15 and 16 before raise the age legislation held in on cash bail and cash bail is nothing more than about what's in your bank account. Cash bail is simply supposed to be any, any form of bail is supposed to be to ensure someone's return to court. And that is not at all how it's used. It is used to detain people who are poor. It is disproportionately affects black and brown people, LGBTQIA folks, folks with disabilities, people from marginalized communities and we should be ending cash bail in its entirety. Money bail is unjust, unfair, does not keep us safe. You know, we've been sold this false choice between public safety and incarceration. And in fact, we are safer when we don't lock people up, when we address the underlying issues that they're facing, whether it be substance use disorder, mental health issues, um, poverty, homelessness, food insecurity, et cetera. And so I think that, that the uh, bail reform laws do not go nearly far enough and we should be abolishing money bail in its entirety. Thank you. Thank you. Alvin, in the prosecution and sentencing of violent crimes, how may it fit or not fit into the larger call to reduce the prison population? Thank you for the question. Vi violent crime, the way it's prosecuted now, is, it doesn't work. We, we are overly punitive in many instances and we do absolutely nothing for the survivors of violent crime. You look at uh, the doctor, the, the former doctor who was a gynecologist at Columbia and the process that the survivors of his crimes were put through, the coarseness of the uh, district attorney's office's system, focusing on whether they can quote, win the case and not thinking about procedural justice and how the survivors of violent crimes are treated. So we have to be survivor focused in all that we do and trauma informed. Uh, when we're talking about violent crime. And then we need to think about the ripple effects of communities and what really make survivors whole. So we need to be talking about and applying restorative justice principles, uh, giving survivors of violent crime the opportunity to uh, confront uh, the, the folks who've done them harm and get to and talk about the root cause of harm. I come from a neighborhood, I started with those three gunpoint incidents when I was a youth. I know violence up front. I've stared into the eyes of a loved one whose best friend was shot in front of him and killed. We have to deal with this as a systemic issue that affects not just those directly who see it, but our entire communities because the trauma affects us all. Thank you. Thank you, Tali. What program alternatives do you envision as a substitute to jail 
time, for jail time. Thank you, Sylvia. It's, that's a great question because uh, it cuts across so many different categories of crime and areas of practice. And uh, I think it really demands a commitment to the principle that incarceration should be a last resort. Uh, that was the very first principle in DA Gonzalez's uh, plan for criminal justice reform in the Brooklyn DA's office and the vision that we tried to put in motion over there. And it means that uh, when it is possible to achieve public safety without jail, without prison, one should do that. Uh, I can pick from so many, including diversion programs for um, people suffering from mental health illnesses, from substance abuse, uh, all the way to uh, a program in the Brooklyn DA's office, which I hope to bring to Manhattan for first time offenders found to be in possession of a gun and who are young at the time, almost always young men, almost always young men of color went into this program in Brooklyn. And the, the program allowed them to agree to doing a tailor-made and intensive uh, program, right, uh, which involved uh, whatever their needs were, mental health, job training, other kinds of support. And if they were successful um, in going through the course of the program, then at the end, uh, the charges were dismissed and the person was given a second chance, you know, for a young person, really critical, um, avoiding incarceration completely. And uh, um, I think that we have to bring that framework really to everything that we can do consistent with public safety. Yeah, no. What is your opinion with respect to the closing of Rikers Island and the suggestion of building of the building of community jails throughout the city of New York? Well, thank you for asking, Sylvia. There's probably no issue that is more important to me than closing Rikers, given the 80 year horrific history of what's gone on there and how we can turn the page as a city and erase that moral stain from from our landscape. Uh, I, for those who don't know, I was the uh, uh, an advocacy director at Just Leadership USA. And for two years, I led the campaign to close Rikers, managing a 180 organization coalition, working with formerly incarcerated people, people who had suffered at Rikers Island and whose family members had suffered there too. Uh, I've So I've long called for the closure of Rikers. I believe that we can close Rikers without building new jails if we actually implement the reforms that I've proposed and that I'm heartened to see so many of my opponents proposing as well. We need to get the jail population in the city so low that we don't need to build new jails to replace Rikers Island. I was the first candidate to uh, declare my support for closing Rikers without building new jails. I did so before the city council voted in 2019. And I think the way we do it is by expanding our access to mental health care, giving young people an off ramp from the criminal justice system better than we do now, uh, ending cash bail. And, uh, and going to Albany and being an ally and fixing technical parole reform and other issues that keep people in our system pre-trial. So I believe that we can close Rikers. I feel that's essential and imperative moral goal for our city and we can do it without building new jail facilities. Thank you. Dan, as a New York assemblyman and a civil litigator, you've released a quote, do not prosecute list of 18 or so crimes that include disorderly conduct, resisting arrest if there is no other charge, trespassing if the individual is homeless, possession of alcohol by a minor, possession of marijuana, and would go further on that front, saying you wouldn't prosecute people for selling pot either, noting that incarceration would be a last resort in an effort to decarceration, reduce racial disparities, and decriminalize poverty. I'm sure I've left that a few things. <laughs> but this is very, this is a tall order. What, what has led you to make that, what has led you to create that list of do not, to do not prosecute, of do not prosecute items? And how do you expect to be successful? Well, it's, it's a great question. It's in a fundamental pillar of my campaign, which is about decarceration, but also reducing people's criminal records. And that's a big problem we have. Work I'm going to be doing in Albany to be able to expunge people's records. But the most clearest, the most direct way to get people the service they, they need is not through diversion programs. It's to decline to prosecute. And that the office through its social workers acts with a liaison with the not-for-profit providers who provide mental health services, homeless services, drug treatment services, 
through the city budget. My fundamental belief is those services can be provided better to people outside of the courtroom. And that is a difference and a distinction from some of the other candidates in this race who really think they can use the tools of the office in a kinder or gentler way. I reject that approach. The best way to go about this is to decline those charges that I enumerated in my plan, but get people the help that they need. And, and, and that's the best way I think we can avoid not only decarceration, but reduce the number of people who have criminal records, which has expanded in the 11 years under Vance, despite my efforts in the legislature for the better part of 10 years to create a universal right of expungement, which is necessary because what Vance has done over the past 10 years. Thank you. Diana, as a former top deputy of Manhattan District Attorney for Cy Vance's office, working there since 1995, you stated in the city that the DA's office has, quote, lost its way. Further in your resignation letter of January 2020, you said that you faced a hostile work environment, quote, bullying and interference with pending legal cases. Can you expand upon these views and tell us what processes, if any, you would implement to terminate such behavior if elected? Thank you so much. You know, I was very much an outsider in that office. I, I prosecuted crimes of power on behalf of undocumented immigrants and workers and tenants, and that wasn't supported. And ultimately, um, I was uh, ultimately led to re resign because of that. In fact, my resource, resources were taken. And in fact, when I was working on a large bribery case, I made a mistake. And I acknowledged that mistake as soon as I learned about it. But that was such a toxic environment. Instead of being uh, supported, I was, I was isolated. No one should feel like that. I was a 25 year prosecutor and I had the confidence to own my mistake, but what about others? We need to change the culture because we serve the people. I am a public servant. I have been that my entire career and the office has lost its way. That is what I learned um, by my mentor, Mr. Morgenthau, and that's what I will restore to that office. We need to support um, people, we need to make sure that the, pro the, the, the immense power of the prosecutor is used to help people, to give opportunity and not obstacle. That is what I will do. Thank you, Diana. Um, Lucy, while Cy Vance was ultimately successful in handling the Weinstein case, um, it hasn't silenced criticism from his past reluctance to prosecute similar accusations against affluent and prominent men. As a current assistant district attorney in Cy Vance's office, recently you received the endorsement, as you mentioned, of some of the Weinstein victims, while that case has, still appears to be pending on appeal. Um, how do you respond to the criticism that you may be politicizing the victims of the crime for your own benefit. Thank you for elevating the important issues that these women have helped shine a light on. Uh, first, I'll say that I'm no longer an assistant in that office and had no involvement in that investigation, that my relationship has been with these women in doing work around trauma-informed prosecution and creating protocols for training prosecutors on how to handle cases better, not just sex crimes and gender-based violence, but all kinds of crimes. One of the primary issues that I see uh, in that case was the sense of backdoor dealing. And I announced, the day I announced my candidacy, a policy for equal access under my administration. And that's a policy in which there will be no backdoor meetings between well-heeled defense lawyers, regardless of who they represent or their relationship with the district attorney or senior leadership in the district attorney's office. The public defenders will have same access to senior staff as 
private lawyers do. I commit to having public defenders on my transition team and on an advisory council that convenes regularly to discuss matters of policy. I think that all of these things are critical to creating a workplace that, and rather a, a justice system that values the experience of survivors and the experience of people who go through the system. And that's just what I commit to doing as district attorney. Thank you. Tahani, as an attorney whose career focuses on criminal and civil rights law, in city and state, you stated, you in city and state, you called for the resignation of Cy Vance in January, taking issue with the way the office has been run under his supervision, arguing that his office excessively prosecutes people of color of color, coerces pleas and withholds evidence. You also noted that you wanted, wanted to minimize the footprint of the Manhattan DA's office on people's lives and hold the office accountable by being collaborative and transparent. Can you explain how you intend to accomplish this if you're appointed DA and knowing that you have spoken about some of these points earlier. Could you try to help us illuminate on what you mean by the office becoming collaborative and transparent? Absolutely. So uh, as a civil rights attorney, one of the things that I've been doing for over 10 years is holding these agencies accountable, the NYPD, the Department of Education, our fire department, and taking these policies and changing them so that we're not just doing damage control, we're making sure that these violations don't happen again. And make no mistake, these are adversarial waters. Um, it's a, a different experience to sue our NYPD and then sit across the table from the commissioner as you rewrite policy. I'm the only candidate to have done that in this race. That is what I've been doing for 10 years. And my problem, again, is not just with Vance, it's this entire system that I've seen and been exposed to since my early teenage years and all of my siblings. Um, and so when I say make it transparent, we have a, convi a conviction integrity unit that is a lame duck, almost does nothing. Secondly, again, we're talking about prosecuting first and getting people help. No, we need to decline to prosecute and get this office out of the way, but not just send people for help, actually take this billion dollar of money, stop the hundreds of thousands of dollars we're wasting on meaningless prosecutions and send them to these organizations. And when I say collaborative, I mean making sure that we have this office represented by impacted people, not just people of color, but those who have been prosecuted, incarcerated, or victimized. Those who have expertise in the areas of criminal justice reform, law, and anything else that is going to take us away from relying on police and prosecution um, and towards um, focusing on the public health sector. And I will also you. just add, making sure that our office is transparent by having data readily um, available and reviewed to the public to help change the laws that we can in the office. Thank you. Liz, thank you. in October of 2020, Eight of the candidates this evening signed an open letter calling on Governor Andrew Cuomo to grant mass clemencies to prisoners aged 50 and older, among other things, because of the health risks posed by the coronavirus. I want to note at this juncture that DA Cy Vance did not join in signing that letter. As a former assistant district attorney and current criminal defense attorney, and as a more moderate candidate for district attorney, what is the reason or reasons why you did not join, join in with the eight others in signing this letter? You're muted. Muted. Well, uh, thanks for the question. While I agreed with the spirit and tenor of that letter and properly uh, going for compassionate release. I did not sign up for mass clemency. I don't think there should be mass incarceration. I don't think there should be mass clemency. I think each case has to be held on an individual case by case basis. If you read the letter as it read that all people over 55 then get, get clemency and get released, that's an argument for Harvey Weinstein to be released. That's an argument for Yasmin Ortega to be released. I think you have to play the tape 
fully on these cases. I have to, you have to say that it doesn't just apply to, to one person, it applies to all people. So I didn't think that that was the tenor of the, the, the letter. I don't think that Harvey Weinstein should get compassionate release. I don't think Yasmin Ortega should get compassionate release. And I think it should be done on an individual basis. I had the courage of my convictions not to sign a letter and to stand out and above. That is leadership. And that's why I didn't do it because I don't think the letter was correct calling for mass clemency. I think, and I think that clemency is also done under the roots of the governor. And I think the governor very much likes to keep his job of, you know, he makes those kinds of decisions. So I think that again, clemency should be decided on an individual basis and not on a one, on, not on a mass basis where people who've just recently gone to jail should not be let out of jail. So that's what I think. Thank you, Elijah. As a legal aid attorney, as a legal aid attorney and the only public defender in the race, in an interview with Under the Radar, you opined with respect to reforms that, quote, it can't just be tinker tinkering on the edges. It has to be sweeping overhauls because of the racism and white supremacy that exists within our criminal legal system, end quote. Do you believe that systemic racism and white supremacy exists in the New York City uh, penal system? I absolutely do. I think, um, thank you for asking that question and for quoting me. I think it's quite clear that systemic racism forms the basis of our criminal punishment bureaucracy. Uh, you'll notice I'll never say criminal justice system because it's not justice, certainly not justice for all. And after you know spending over a decade as a public defender and representing over 3000 human beings charged with crimes, I saw who was being paraded into court in handcuffs, who was being charged more harshly, who was not receiving uh, sweetheart deals that meant no incarceration or you know, default to treatment or lower level charges. And there was no transparency as to that. You know, this is why I have a criminologist on my campaign and why that we are so focused on data and releasing that data to the public because it is so critical. That is the only way we will be able to overhaul this and to elect a public defender, someone who's not ever worked as a prosecutor. I see that as a positive. I think that, that not having prosecuted cases is what is needed to have someone who has the perspective of what kind of devastating effects every single case can have on the lives of human beings. You know, people talk about Trump's family separation policy at our Southern border. Well, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office has a family separation policy and we do not call it out nearly enough. They stand up every day in court and say, on behalf of the people of the state of New York. So they are acting in your name with your tax dollars and they are doing things like locking up black and brown people at disproportionate numbers. We must change that. And I am dedicated to doing so as your next Manhattan District Attorney. Thank you. Alvin. In the wake of the killing of George Floyd and other black Americans at the hands of law enforcement, the qualified immunity doctrine has come under increased scrutiny from activists and elected officials. Simply put, when applied to police officers, qualified immunity means that officers can rarely be subject to civil lawsuits in their individual capacities over allegations of excessive force, brutality, or other misconduct while on the job. In other words, they have a certain immunity to such legal responsibility based on the jobs they have, the justification of which is level of danger and necessity of quick decision-making in their jobs. What views, if any, do you have about maintaining or eliminating the qualified immunity doctrine as it stands today? We need to end qualified immunity, full stop. Uh, I'm a professor at New York Law School. I joined with uh, a number of my colleagues and experts in this area on a panel a couple of months ago to talk about this issue and talk about the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which would address it. Uh, so I would end it full stop, but we need to take a step back and look more broadly. Qualified immunity is the tip of the iceberg. I told you I went to law school because of gunpoint stops. I've spent my entire career working on this issue. My first case 20 years ago was suing the state police on behalf of members of the Onondaga Nation for excessive force. 
Uh, I'm currently representing the family of Eric Garner suing Mayor de Blasio in the city of New York to get transparency six, six plus years after Mr. Garner died, who was killed. We do not know the identities of the police officers who were there on the site. We don't know about the medical treatment. We do not know so many key details. We had to go to court to get them. So qualified immunity we can do, but we need prosecutors to step up like I have throughout my career. I prosecuted an FBI agent for lying, uh, prosecuted a, a, a district attorney who mishandled uh, a case where a police officer he worked with shot at eight times, an unarmed black man. We need prosecutors to do these cases, do them in a transparent way, do them without fear or favor, follow the facts wherever they go. That's what I've done for the last 20 plus years. I think about this issue every single day of my life. Myself, my kids, my entire family are affected every day. It's priority one for me. Thank you, Tali. As a former Department of Justice counsel to then Attorney General Eric Holder and also prosecutor in Brooklyn, you noted that the New York Dis District Attorney needs to set an example in delivering justice for all in the New York Daily News, you quoted that if elected DA, you would use the resources, tools, and strategies laid out to ensure that the office does its part to respond to the horrible trauma of gun violence on the people who live and work in the borough. You would target ghost, ghost guns or weapons such as homemade guns that appear to be a growing problem and establish the creation of a gun court in New York County dedicated to handling firearm prosecutions, alleged handling cases from open to close within six months. Why do you feel that New York County must lead the way? Why New York? <laughs> Uh, that's that's almost a, a deep question about the place of New York in the world. Uh, but look, Sylvia, I do think that we should aim to set a national example uh, in this and in other things, but this is exactly the right place to start because this absolutely has to be a first priority for a district attorney. As you know, here in New York, we have seen shootings more than double since last year, and the year is not even out, and that includes the months that people were locked in. And you know, one of the reasons why we should be a model, Sylvia, is because we live in a blue state with blue in a blue city. So we have excellent gun safety laws, and yet we have this intense problem right now of gun violence, and it requires a complex plan. I have a 10-point plan, and I thank you for reviewing parts of it. We have to take on these ghost guns, guns where you could buy parts online and put them together yourself, and which are not adequately regulated by the federal government. We have to stem the flow with gun trafficking that requires someone with the leadership and experience to know how to work with federal and state partners in working on the flow of guns that come in interstate, usually up from the south. We have to get guns out of the hands of domestic abusers, uh, people who would use the gun as an instrument of control and power and, of course, of violence. We have to enforce red flag laws. We have to have progressive strategies when appropriate, like the gun diversion program that we spoke about in response to an earlier question of yours. And of course, support for communities um, in the ways that they can help also uh, interrupt gun violence. And I do think we could be an example on this. Thank you, Janos. As a former ACLU, attorney and decarceration activist. You allege that New York County locks up individuals at a higher rate than any other borough, and if elected, you would commit to reducing the number of Manhattan defendants in New York City jails by 80% by the end of your first term. That is a very tall order. Can you explain how you intend to accomplish this goal? Absolutely. And, you know, for those who've been watching and hearing a lot of policies float around, a lot of principles and ideas floating around, this is a real commitment. And this is what we launched our campaign with, saying that we would commit to cutting the uh, pretrial incarceration rate by 80% in Manhattan. That is something that I can be held to by the community. That is something that people can measure and watch and know that we're actually doing what we said we we're going to do, not just stating principles and loosely following them once we're elected. This is something that is the cornerstone of my campaign. 
because ultimately all the ideas that we need to achieve flow from that. Reforming the way we approach mental health so that people who are struggling with mental health don't wind up in our jail system. Ending cash bail so that there's never somebody spending a night on Rikers Island or in the tombs because of their inability to pay. Uh, making sure that young people get paired uh, even more frequently with programs like Avenues for Justice, which do incredible work turning young people's lives around, even when they're charged with serious crimes. And one of the things that I'm really excited about is just this morning, uh, a group of criminal justice organizations, really widely respected grassroots groups from across the city, put out a gold standard for what they expect from all of us. They're about to make demands of all the candidates here. And one of the main uh, requirements that they're going to have for their support is committing to an 80% decarceration rate, the very thing that we launched our campaign with more than a year ago. So I'm proud to say that we have the gold standard for what decarceration looks like. We have the plan for it. And now I hope that uh, we can get elected and implemented. Thank you. Dan, in an interview with City Limits, you stated that you want to end mass gang arrests based on surveillance or databases. Can you explain what you mean by this, please? Yes, uh, there's a basic principle here. We'll prosecute people for what they do, not who they associate with. Um, and this is not an academic issue. Cy Vance uh, locked up 103 kids from West Harlem uh, during his tenure on these loose conspiracy charges. And for the listeners, listeners out there, this is a point of distinction between basically the prosecutors in this race and at least three or four of us who are not prosecutors. But more to the point, this is something I've been fighting for for years, ending the conspiracy charges which criminalize poverty, which criminalize race. I've been working on this with Legal Aid Society and with criminal justice advocates in the community, in East Harlem, the, uh, getting, uh, getting tenants and tenant associations to go through the academic of exercise of foiling themselves and their grandsons and their granddaughters to see if the NYPD or Cy Vance is spying on them. I won't do it. You see, you cannot target a community with your left hand and with the right hand offer to be a credible messenger or messenger for reform. It doesn't work that way. One of the first things I'll do uh, as district attorney will be to be very public and detailed that we will not use the gang conspiracy charges to target black and brown boys and men in communities of color throughout Manhattan. Thank you. Diana, in the city, you noted that you plan to launch your campaign with the support of labor leaders and unions in the building sector noting that the city's essential workers are your number one priority. Do you expect to take major contributions from labor unions and other large entities, such as real estate developers and corporations? And if so, why? So first off, um, I am absolutely not taking real estate developer money because I absolutely believe that like police, they have um, acted with impunity. And those are crimes of power that I have made a priority by launching a housing bureau. So no real estate money I intend to prosecute. That's also why I have a housing bureau. Uh, in terms of corporations, no corporate contributions. But as for labor unions, with the exception of law enforcement unions, I am very proud not only to have the support of hundreds of thousands of essential workers throughout this state, but to get their financial support as well. The reality is this is an expensive race and I need to raise, I need to raise money in order to compete. And that's, I can only, can, I can only get, um, represent their interests and their interest of all everyday New Yorkers if I am able to take their contributions. I am very proud when, of, support, of having the support of labor. And, and working men and women know that I go after crimes of power and not poverty. Thank you. Lucy, you were a prosecutor in DA Vance's office for 12 years before leaving. You have voiced a strong opinion that if elected DA of New York County, that you would unveil a proposal to crack down on elder scams and unhealthy nursing homes. Do you have any insight into why Cy Vance's office has an elder, elder bureau um, that does so little, frankly, when it There's comes tremendous to the Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was that was me modifying my own question. That does so little when it comes to modifying crimes against the elderly. 
Crimes against the elderly are absolutely unconscionable. And one of the areas that the district attorney can really help protect our most vulnerable New Yorkers, especially as we emerge from the pillages of this pandemic, is by prioritizing um, looking into and prosecuting people who have taken advantage of elderly New Yorkers and New Yorkers who are vulnerable, immigrants, people with pre-existing health conditions, et cetera. And the scams that we have seen developing um, around identity theft and uh, snake oil sales are just heartbreaking. So the room for growth is tremendous and I am committed to investing in supporting that uh, that area of prosecution. I want to also touch on another another area that hasn't come out tonight, but with respect to to um, communities that deserve additional support. I'm really pleased to today have announced my plans for better supports for the LGBTQ plus communities in New York City. And when we talk about gender-based violence, sometimes I think that the, the needs of LGBTQ plus communities get shunted to the side. So I have a plan that would make the district attorney's office more accessible and responsive to those communities that would seek to build trust with LGBTQ plus communities that would ensure police accountability for mistreatment of those communities, to make sure that crimes against LGBTQ plus New Yorkers are taken seriously, that advocates for the repeal of the walking while trans bill, and that recognizes that sex work is work, that we should decriminalize and Time. find to prosecute sex between consenting adults. Thank you. Tahani, in a city limits interview, you vowed not to seek any sentences greater than 20 years, AKA death by incarceration. Does that mean that the values, does that mean that the value of someone's life is only worth 20 years of incarceration? Death, if we're gonna be against the death penalty, it has to include death by incarceration. My father was sentenced to 22 years when I was 14. My youngest sibling was six at the time. He missed every wedding, every graduation, the birth of 16 of his grandkids. He had triple bypass surgery. We weren't allowed to visit him for months later. We were driving eight hours into Ohio just to cram the nine of us or eight of us in two different sessions in the three or four hours we had to see him. We had to share the handful of minutes he had every month that were wildly expensive. And he came home in his 60s, just like every other person released from prison comes home with nothing. Had he not had a family, had he not had uh, a community to come to, we would be in a very different situation. Mental health issues, housing stability, financial stability. These people are people, they're part of families and communities. They come home and they remain our responsibility. Not only that, when we keep people incarcerated for longer periods, their health deteriorates faster. And now we become the largest maximum security elder facility where we're treating them for all of their ailments and they're essentially palliative care, their end of life care is in a prison cell. And so the question is, when is it enough? How much do we take from someone and still seek more? And would death even be enough? What comes after when we've, we've satisfied this quest for punishment with death? Time. So I think absolutely, it's not a reflective of the value of human life, but it is a reflection of actually rehabilitation and focusing on fixing things and then moving forward in a real Time. way. Thank you, thank Thanks. you. Liz, you allege that your position as a candidate is a, more is a more moderate approach to the business of being a district attorney or a self-described centrist in the race and that as a candidate you would like to change how hate crimes are dealt with can you can you expand upon your moderate approach and how you would deal differently with hate crimes well i think that i i, I come at it from a, a perspective of being a defense attorney for the past 12 years and representing people and being very understanding that to have change sometimes actions have to have consequences, not necessarily incarceration, but I do think consequences. We have to give people a chance 100%, but there is a time where public safety matters, victims matter. I also, as being a practitioner, I am a trained mediator and went to the New York Peace Institute. And I, I did the 40 hour training for medi 
mediation. And I think in hate crimes, mediation and restorative justice is a key goal in terms of getting people to respect each other and, and keeping it to where we can really use it as a learning experience. But at the same time, I have enough experience with defendants. Some of them don't want to learn. Some of them don't care. And I think we, we have to try and make a chance to change people where we can. And I think if people who want to change, we should we give them the opportunity to. The fact of the matter is not everyone wants that opportunity. And sometimes it falls upon the criminal justice system to make that change. And I think that's just realistic, realistic and common sense and having practically worked in the courthouse for, for 20 years. Sometimes people are their own worst victims and I think you just have to acknowledge that fact. And listen, being a prosecutor is a really tough job. You have to make really tough decisions. And I think that if you have to make those tough decisions and you also understand defendants and where they're coming from, and sometimes it's a mistake, sometimes it's a bad day, and sometimes it's a bad person. And I think that those are the things that people I'm don't talk about. And I think that that's where my centrist view comes from. Thank you. Eliza, if elected district attorney, you have vowed to create, quote, special bureaus to combat corrupt pu public officials, exploitative landlords and employers, and also police who commit acts of physical abuse and perjury and who engage in violations of civil rights. Given the chief judges, judge of the Court of Appeals desire to merge the present court system, who do you intend to sell your idea to the Office of Court? Who do you intend to sell your ideas to in the Office of Court Administration and in the court system, especially given the fact that we already have specialized criminal, criminal courts that could try cases? Well, I. To be fair, I don't think I have to sell my idea to anyone. I think as Manhattan District Attorney, I will have the power to create units and prosecute cases as I see fit. And as a public defender, you know, I have seen rampant misconduct um, with stunning regularity on the part of the police, for example, you know, not just the, the abuse and harassment and violence that we've seen in the streets, but also perjury in the courthouse, falsifying of documents and false arrests. And even when I raised those to the district attorney's office, nothing was ever done. And this chronic misconduct on the part of the police um, and really erodes our, our public trust and harms our communities. And I think that the Manhattan District Attorney's Office has truly been complicit in the continuing misconduct perpetrated by the NYPD. And they've used their power to shield and protect police officers instead of holding them accountable. And so when I'm Manhattan District Attorney, police misconduct will never be tolerated upon assuming office. I will have a unit that specifically prosecutes police misconduct. There's no reason we need a specialized court for it. They can be prosecuted in New York Supreme and New York Criminal Court because true accountability for police misconduct is what will make our communities safer. And it's time to restore the trust and integrity to the Manhattan District Attorney's office and I will do just that. Thank you. Thank you. Alvin, as district attorney, you noted that you would hire people who were once incarcerated to lead efforts to make prison re-entry work better. How would this approach act to reform the criminal justice system? Thank you. Those closest to these issues know them best. And I know that from my own life experience. So my brother-in-law, who's 10 years younger than my wife, was incarcerated and he lived with us, my wife and me, for a year plus uh, when he got out. And I saw what I already knew intellectually. I'd spent time in the attorney general's office investigating companies that were reflexively discriminating based on criminal history. So I knew this issue, but watching him sleep on my couch and get up and go and look for work every day and knowing his skill set and seeing him turned away that's the kind of experience I want in my office. I want people who've known that, seen that, who, who can walk the walk and not just talk the talk, uh, who've had Thanksgiving dinner with someone who was in solitary confinement and said, you know what? All I could do in their album was read the Bible and do push-ups. That type of thinking needs to be ingrained in our office. What the system does, people who leave, live it and breathe it, 
That's how I would hire. And I did that in the attorney general's office. The first person I hired to head our special, to, to work in our special prosecution unit, not only was skilled and was able to prosecute police officers, but he had a master's in social work. We need to hire people and promote people as whole people so that they will look at the folks who come before them as whole people, people like my brother-in-law. That's what I would do if I were district attorney. Thank you. Tali, you allege that you hold a more moderate view supporting ending cash bail, but allowing judges to use, quote, dangerousness to determine whether to detain someone before trial, which is a position staunchly opposed by many criminal justice advocates. Can you tell us how you arrived at these conclusions? Sure. Uh, so uh, let me please start by saying that um, I am an advocate of bail reform. And in fact, I'm proud to have been a part of the leadership team in the Brooklyn DA's office in the years in which we reduced our pretrial jail population by 80%. The number that we've thrown around in the course of this night voluntarily uh, by ourselves uh, having our ADAs uh, switch to a default of not asking for bail in most misdemeanor cases. And we did that without any cost to public safety. Uh, so I was very pleased to see that what followed from that example was legislation that had the effect of radically reducing the pretrial uh, population. Um, and, and all of the horrible externalities that come with incarcerating people unnecessarily and unjustly. However, uh, I do think that there is room for improvement. I would have gotten rid of cash bail completely for some of the reasons that we have heard tonight. I find it deeply offensive that there should be a connection between money and freedom. And I do think that in a very narrow category of cases, when there is strong evidence to show that a person is a present danger to others, it is important to be able to say that in court and to ask for pretrial detention. I'm thinking, for example, of a domestic violence case where there is a ton of data to show that separating the assailant from the victim after arrest, immediately after arrest, is deeply important in saving her life. And, you know, as a federal prosecutor, we didn't have cash bail. We were able to make arguments about a danger to other in limited circumstances. And I think Fine. that's a system that better achieves public safety as well as justice. Thank you. Janos, with the move away from incarceration as a means to addressing crime, what would you see as the proper path? for perpetrators of domestic violence? If the answer is not, in is not incarceration, how does that protect the victims? And shouldn't that be the priority? We have to understand that right now in this city, victims of domestic violence and intimate partner violence are by and large not being protected by our current system. It is one of the most common crimes in this city it is hardly ever reported. It is rarely properly investigated and taken seriously by both the police and prosecutor's offices. The small number of cases that actually wind up in front of DA's offices represent a tiny fraction of actual cases of domestic and intimate partner violence. So the system we have today does not protect victims. Uh, the first thing we have to do is create an environment where victims feel safe coming forward, where they know that their stories will be taken seriously. That is again, not the case at NYPD precincts around the city right now. So we proposed a plan to reimagine how we respond in a partner violence, where we can make it easier for people to come forward, to hear their story, to have a social worker present from the beginning of a case to make a person feel safe, exposing that most vulnerable and difficult episode in their lives. Then once the case actually begins, recognizing that the one size fits all solution of either putting somebody in jail or not is probably not satisfactory to either the, the victim or, or certainly the person who committed the harm. The goal here should be to break the cycle of harm from happening again in the future. And that means listening to the victim. What do they actually want? They probably want that person to stop committing the harm. That might mean looking at issues with substance use. That might mean issues of trauma, anger management. There are other ways that we can get somebody to stop committing the harm than just putting them in a jail for a week or a month and thinking that's somehow gonna solve the underlying issue. And in our office, we're gonna always keep track of how the victims felt their experiences went both on these cases and other types of cases, so that we know that we're actually doing a good job protecting them. Thank you. This last series of questions will be one minute each 
just to get in some of the some more questions from our viewers and then we'll be moving to closing statements. Dan, can you explain your approach to handling cases in which there's been a serious injury or death involving a motor vehicle? What department in your office would handle such a case? And how would you assess whether a crime has been committed in crashes involving fatalities as opposed to cr critical injuries and serious injuries? as defined in section 10.00 of the penal law, one minute. Vehicular violence is a significant problem representing uh, the district that I do in Midtown Manhattan with the bridges and tunnels. We deal yearly or seasonally with so many problems for pedestrians and bicyclists that are, are injured, severely injured on occasion, uh, killed by aggressive or reckless driving. Uh, the problem in part is the current district attorney, Cy Vance, has shown no interest other than putting together a grand jury uh, uh, last year, which was for show purposes, to then blame the legislature for failing to act. I have legislation that would lower the standard for the exact purpose that I, as district attorney, would then be able to prosecute individuals engaged in vehicular violence, not for purposes of incarceration, not because I want long jail sentences, or in most cases, any jail sentences because the current administrative process through the city of New York is a complete failure. It's not a true adjudicative process. So through the different trial bureaus within my office, I'm gonna elevate these issues and prosecute for accountability Time. purposes. Thank you. Diana, the New York District, the New York Police Department often takes unilateral action that prevents justice in vehicular car crash, in vehicular crash, cases. For example, the New York Police Department officers will decide not to investigate crashes because they do not think the district attorney will prosecute them, or the New York PD does not send officers to tribunal hearings, resulting in the majority of failure to yield cases being thrown out by oath judges. How will you work with the New York Police Department and the oath judges to ensure that reckless drivers will be held accountable for their actions? You know, it's very simple. We need to proactively investigate every single con um, traffic fatality or serious physical injury. That's just a fact. I did that when I was chief of the construction fraud task force. Every, every single injury or fatality some of them ended up being criminal, some weren't. And I, I did those personally. I went out. That's what I would do as DA. I would make sure we have a unit de um, devoted to that. But the police wouldn't have the discretion. We would have the information from the start. And then what we do is if we believe that the current law is inadequate, you know what? We write new laws to uh, fix those loopholes. I am the only candidate here who as a, a working prosecutor, when I went after crimes of power, I saw loopholes in the wage theft bill, in fines for corporate, corporate defendants that killed people, that the maximum fine was only $10,000. I wrote a bill called Carlos's Law that would change that fine to a million dollars. That's what we need to do in, in vehicular cases. If we see that there are, are you know, frankly, loopholes, then we need to fix them and Thank we need to proactively investigate. Lucy, Vehicular Violence Accountability Act. Will you push for such an act that would create a vehicular violence status in penal law that will allow traffic violation, that will, will allow traffic violence excuse me, to receive similar penalties as drunken driving. I've responded to the scene of cases where people have been run over on their bicycles and their families have arrived to find their loved one gone. I am heartbroken at the numbers of people who are devastated on our city streets by reckless drivers, by intoxicated drivers, and others. I would have to review very carefully any bill on the issue to make sure that it is appropriately handled by the criminal justice system. But I do believe that we need to be proactive in investigating every case of fatality or injury related to cars in this city because we are such a car dependent city. 
So without reviewing the legislation, I can't commit to it, but I look forward to reviewing it and do aspire to ensure that people who hurt others with vehicles are held appropriately responsible. Tahani, do you agree with the rule of two that requires two chargeable misdemeanors to be present for a charge of criminal negligence to be brought? If not, what, if anything, would you do to try and challenge judicial precedents supporting the rule? So one of the things that, that we need to do at this office that I intend to do is to make it independent. What makes this office so powerful is both its budget, but more importantly, its prosecutorial discretion, which should not be intimidated by not the judiciary or the NYPD or any other interest uh, that seeks to use this office in its personal capacity. I think that um, instead of just committing to upping charges, the goal is to decarcerate, and that means shrinking the footprint of this office. And while before we get into the charges, we should take a step back and ask, do we need to be charging? Is this the right place for the underlying circumstances to be uh, dissected? And you'll find that in majority of these cases, they shouldn't. Um, and when you look at what might be qualifying as criminal negligence, you'll find that sometimes a lot of these are crimes of poverty that includes substance use disorder, uh, mental health, uh, poverty, homelessness. And so there shouldn't be a wholesale rule on anything what's required to charge or not. What that also um, does, again, influence the DA's office to continue to upcharge things that people are actually innocent of. Thank you. Liz, hit and run. What criteria would your office consider to determine whether a driver who left the scene of a crash causing personal injury had a quote, cause to know, end quote, that a crash had taken place? And if you have any ideas of specific circumstances from your long career, would you enumerate on that in less than 60 seconds. Yeah, my, my firm, we represented the first individual who had a case brought against him under Vision Zero. Um, it was a Jamaican bus driver who actually stayed on the scene, but he, the, unfortunately the bicyclist was killed. It was an accident. I think criminalizing accidents is the wrong thing to do. And they criminalized this accident and it was very unfortunate that this man died, but this was a hardworking guy who had a family of five, who had a leg injury, who used, to, who used to work in the trucking industry, who became a bus driver because he, um, because he couldn't do physical manual labor anymore. And he had an accident, he stayed, he wasn't speeding, it was not intentional, but under vision zero and this test case and it being a press case, they, the district attorney's office asked for jail. That is someone who should have never gone for jail. I think, I think that that is something that has to be looked at with traffic with traffic cases and vehicular crimes. It has, you have to look at the surrounding circumstances. What was the speed of the driver? Where did they go? How did it happen? These are all fact-driven, fact specific things that have to go into how you prosecute those kinds of cases. Thank you. Elijah, use of evident, use of event data recorder and driver's phone log. Please explain the criteria your office will consider to examine the event data recorder or other comparable device located in a vehicle involved in a crash and provide a specific example, if you can, within the 60 seconds. You're only giving me 60 seconds for this one. So, if you, so I'll talk fast. So, you know, as a public defender, I represented a young man who was 19 years old with no criminal record, and he was charged with negligent homicide. He was driving down Bowery. Someone stepped out between cars, not on the crosswalk. It was dark out, and he unfortunately crashed into this person, and um, the person passed away. Um, it was a horrible situation, devastating for every family involved. Um, but this is a, this, we're talking about a teenager, a kid who, um, and, and I know that, that in trying to bring this case against him, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office was trying to use a number of things um, from his vehicle, from his phone, et cetera, to potentially up the level of the charge against him and seek an incarceratory sentence for him. I don't think that that, that makes our city safer in any way. I don't think that that is the way in which we figure out how to 
end mass incarceration and make a system that is just for all people. Alvin, New York City spends over $10 billion annually on, on the law enforcement apparatus with the bulk of it going to the NYPD whose practices drive the entire big bloated system. There are proposals being discussed that would cut expenditures by several billions of dollars and ad, ad, oh, allocate, excuse me, these funds to improve academic outcomes for all, for all children across racial and class lines, expand health and mental health services and public work projects providing jobs and training. What would you describe as some of the abuses, if any, of the police power in New York City? Thank you, Sylvia. I know about community reinvestment firsthand. My mom was a career educator starting out on 125th Street, then going to the Barrow Manhattan Community College. Uh, my dad ran the Manhattan Urban League and then ran homeless shelters. I was proud to stand this summer uh, with those who were calling for a $1 billion reduction in the NYPD budget. I know firsthand from my parents' work and equally important, my work as a prosecutor, what makes us safe. And homeless sweeps uh, being done by the NYPD and not by people like my late father does not make us safer. Uh, mental health responses being done by the NYPD and not by uh, doctors and medical care uh, professionals, that does not make us safer. And in fact, the data show that up to 50% of uh, civilian deaths caused by police officers start with a mental health call. And lastly, the school to prison pipeline. Having officers in our schools, an issue I worked on at the Attorney General's office does not make us safer. This is work that I've done and this is work that I've done based in my life history. Thank you. Tali, what changes, if any, of policing should we leave intact and what should be replaced with new entities or fund more generously to promote safety and justice. 60 seconds. <laughs> 60 seconds, uh, right. Uh, Sylvia, I, I think that we need to break down uh, the situations that police respond to into three categories. And I think that these track also, um, they give you a blueprint for reform and prosecution, as well as in policing. First of all, there are the cases where we just don't belong there, where we need a different set of first responders, uh, not law enforcement to respond to a situation, a situation that does not call for force or law. Uh, second, cases where you need someone with another competency, maybe something you don't learn uh, in the police academy or in law school uh, to really meet the needs of the people who have called for help. Uh, and so I'm thinking about social workers, for example, responding to mental health calls and maybe responding alongside police to domestic violence calls. And then, of course, I think in policing and in prosecution, we need to recommit to the mission of protecting the most vulnerable in the face of crime and harm and particularly um, violence. Uh, and that's where the police belong and really that's that's where we belong. Thank you. Janos, defund the police appears to be a popular slogan of the day and remains highly controversial among the public and numerous public figures, including even Vice President Biden. What are your views about defunding the police, slicing the budget and or disbanding entirely certain segments of the police force? Yeah, so this is fortunately something that we've been able to ask thousands of voters about already in this campaign. And what we found is overwhelmingly clear that presented with the choice of spending more of our money on policing or more of our money on programs and services to keep the social safety net strong, especially at a time like this when our economy is struggling and our budgets are gonna be facing really tough choices, people want to invest in the things that will truly keep them safe. Programs for young people, healthcare, education, and not a $6 billion police budget. I was the first candidate to call for $1 billion in cuts to the NYPD budget last budget cycle. And we organized a letter that 50 city council candidates signed on to uh, agreeing that we need to cut 1 billion at least from the budget. I'm gonna be keep, keep banging that drum for this year because we're facing another really tough budget. And if we have to choose between cutting money from the NYPD and doing a lot of the things that other folks have said, taking the police out of certain spaces so that we can have money going to things like youth jobs, education, 
after school programs. That's what we need to be doing right now. So uh, I'm a strong believer that our will be a safer city if we can invest in keeps people safe. Thank you. So now we're coming to our closing statements. I want to thank you all for coming tonight and for sharing your views with us. And we'll begin with the first closing statement by Dan Court. Thank you, Sylvia. And you did a great job tonight. And uh, um, during the first forum in this campaign, in this primary, uh, the question was asked, uh, will you, when times are difficult, when crime might rise, uh, will you stick with it? All of the candidates or most of the candidates talk about reform in one way or another. But that's really the seminal issue uh, for Democrats, for progressive Democrats out there who are looking for a candidate who won't give advances fourth term, who will be different, who will rebuild this office as I have pledged to do. And on that issue, no one has the record that I have. For 21 years in the courtroom, both civil and criminal defense work for poor people, but most significantly in Albany, I have not only fought for, I have achieved actual decarceration, something nobody else in this race can talk about in the way that I have achieved in a district with few impacted family and families. That's my record. So on that seminal issue, who's really going to bring about the reform so many progressive Democrats want? My argument is I'm the best position amongst the non-prosecutors to accomplish that goal. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Thank you so much. You know, I am perhaps the most experienced, but you know what? Experience just makes you old. The reason that I'm the most qualified is I have a vision that comes out of experience and I know what that office is like. I know that the office treats justice as a factory and doesn't pay attention to people. That has never been my approach. I have always looked at every case with a holistic view. I think about survivors and accused and I prioritize people. That meant in my domestic violence uh, years, five years there and 20 years going after crimes of power against 9-11 uh, fraudsters, construction fraud, immigrant fraud, you name it, I have done it. I have prosecuted every type of case in the penal law and I haven't done it in a traditional way. I believe in the trifecta of safety. We can be as safe at home, safe at work, and safe on the street. But it doesn't just mean being safe from being robbed. It also means being safe from being killed by a falling brick by a corrupt contractor. We can use the district attorney's office as a place of opportunity and not obstacle. And it can be a place where no matter who you are, where you live, or what language you speak, that you will be welcome. I am so honored to be a part of this panel tonight. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Lucy. On a snowy Super Bowl Sunday, a couple of years ago, two masked gunmen opened fire on Upper Broadway and shot five people, one of whom died. I spent months investigating the case and ultimately tried it and became close to the mother of the young man who had been killed, who had a three-year-old. I called the mother the day after the trial and asked her how she felt. And she said, I slept all night for the first time since he was killed. But when I woke up, all I could think about were the moms of those two boys, referring to the men who had just been convicted of murdering her son. So from that mom and myself as a mom, I bring a 360 view of the system that is necessary for the next Manhattan District Attorney's Office. I don't believe that there are cases in which there are bad people. I don't tell my kids you're a bad kid. I say you did a bad thing and then we try to fix it. So I'm committed to a District Attorney's Office that will decline to prosecute crimes of poverty, that will work in collaboration with other social service agencies to create pathways to service and housing first, that prioritizes a housing first response to the homelessness crisis that the city is facing. I will build a conviction integrity unit that builds upon and drastically expands the number of cases that the office looks into and creates a retroactive review unit that doesn't just look at claims of innocence, um, but they consider sealing review, clemency, parole, I will commit to ending the reliance on mandatory minimums and the reliance on draconian three strikes. Time. Thank Dahani. you. Dahani. 
tahini. No, tahini is what they put in hummus, Sylvia. You had it good the first time. Okay. Yes, you were good the first time. Uh, thank you so much uh, to both clubs and Sylvia. You did a phenomenal job balancing all of us and our views and platforms. So thank you so much. You know, um, during my father's trial, there was a moment in the courtroom where the judge interrupted the proceedings. And he looks at the prosecutor and says, what are you going to do with all these kids? Pointing to my nine siblings and I in the pews of the courtroom. And without hesitation, she said, they're not my problem. And that was the moment that the system became my problem. I witnessed not only the destabilizing effects on my family of the system, but on our entire community. I came from an immigrant community. My father had a corner store that donated food to the church across the street and to women's shelter around the corner. Pretty much everybody worked in our store uh, to have money for school. And when this happened, the entire community and humanity froze. And so when I was a lawyer, when I was inspired to become a lawyer, I did it to stand by families like mine. And so the last 10 years, I have been in living rooms across this country doing something that no other candidate here can say they did. I've held officers accountable through discipline, termination, or prosecuting them for misconduct. I'm the only candidate here that has actually changed policy in our city to not only keep us safer, but hold these systems accountable. I'm the only candidate here that has represented multiple victims of sexual assault, not only making sure they're heard, but when we talk about justice, it's seen through their eyes and the way they want it done. That's what's missing from this conversation. Those closest to the problem should be closest to the solution, but are often always furthest from the time. It's time that we take this position over and make sure that we create an office that ensures a safe and just society for everyone. Liz. Uh, thanks so much to the CRDC um, and the HK Dems. This was a great opportunity to talk in front of you guys. And again, I am the practitioner in this race. That's what I do day to day. I have been the only person who goes in that building for 20 years and win, lose, draw, I'm gonna be the only person who stays in that building. So that's, that's where I come at from. I come at it from practical reforms, common sense approaches, and it's knowing the full capacity of what the office can do. We are running for this office because quite frankly, we are responsible to the voters and the voters are gonna elect people. And I wanna come back to the voters after four years and say, here's what I've done. And you know what, it's been within the parameters of what we can actually do. Not some esoteric thing of reimagining the office, but what the office actually does. I have the grit and the experience and the smarts and the practicality to make meaningful changes in this office and how we do it. I think it takes knowing both sides of the courtroom to do this and understanding what the defendant's voice is and what the victim's voice is and bringing it together so that we all get justice. Thanks. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you so much, uh, Sylvia. We need someone who's ready on day one for the wide range of issues facing the Manhattan District Attorney. I'm the only candidate here who has overseen an entire progressive law enforcement office. Let's talk about what's waiting for the DA on day one. We have an investigation about Trump. I, when I was the AG's office, we sued Trump more than a hundred times for his policies and we sued him and held him accountable for his misuse of the Trump Foundation. What else do we have waiting? A history of racial discrimination uh, that we need to address. I've led on this my entire life and certainly in my legal career, investigating stop and frisk, representing the family of Eric Garner, prosecuting and the only one here who can held accountable through a conviction, a law enforcement agent. Uh, and then we've got gun violence and sexual assaults that's also waiting on day one. And I've worked on the kind of cases that actually make us safer and importantly, haven't worked on the cases that have been the drivers of mass incarceration. That is my record. We need that on day one. Manhattan deserves no less. Uh, this is not only my work, it is also my life. It is my family, my friends, my neighbors, my community, our community. I'm ready to serve on day one. I ask that you join me in this. And if you have want more information, please go to alvinbragg.com. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. Eliza. Thank you for having us and for taking the time to have this important conversation. I would encourage all of you to keep it going by visiting elizaorleans.com. 
you heard from a lot of candidates tonight, and I know many of them believe the same things I do and have many good ideas. But the question we need to ask is who is actually ready and who has what it takes to make real transformational change. We have to remember that when Cy Vance first ran, even he made promises that sounded good to progressives at the time that he obviously had no intention of keeping and hasn't. I believe my opponent's hearts are in the right places, but as the only public defender in this race, the only one who's represented thousands of people who couldn't afford an attorney in court and seen the many ways in which their lives were devastated by the court system and the current DA, I can tell you that bad policies come from good intentions too. If we elect someone to this office who isn't prepared, who doesn't have the experience to think through all of the implications in the real world, then we run the risk of wasting time on reforms that sound and look good on paper, but, in the, but that in reality will just do more of the same and do further harm. We need someone with the will and authentic commitment to transform the system, who has the experience and perspective to it takes to make big, transformational change. I am that person. I can do both. And I hope that you will join me in the fight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tali. Thank you, Sylvia. Sylvia, we've heard a lot of ideas tonight uh, for how to reform the criminal justice system. And I'm the only candidate who's done the work, who's done the work at a leadership level managing inside a local prosecutor's office just over the river in Brooklyn and doing so many of the things that we talked about tonight. So we talked about reducing the pretrial population in jail. We talked about uh, sentencing reform. I designed and led the creation of the Post-Conviction Justice Bureau in Brooklyn. We talked about wrongful conviction. I managed the premier conviction review unit in the country. We talked about police misconduct. I created the Law Enforcement Accountability Bureau in Brooklyn. I also started tonight, Sylvia, by talking about my own vulnerability as an immigrant being an anchor for me in connecting to the core mission of this job, which is protecting the most vulnerable among us in a system that is fair, also focusing on safety. And that means having someone who is ready to do the work to take on gun violence, to take on gender-based violence, finally, with the multidimensional and sophisticated approach that it deserves, and to prosecute from the streets to the suites, as Bob Morgenthau used to say, drawing on all of my experiences across the American legal system, including in bringing tax evasion case, cases, public corruption cases, violent crime cases, murder cases, cases involving the abuse of children into this job in order to give the people of Manhattan everything um, they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Janos. Thank you all so much for having me. It warms my heart to see so many people who have spent their careers immersed in the system of mass incarceration now wanting to change it. But we have the opportunity to elect a Manhattan district attorney who is fundamentally opposed to these systems of oppression. I've spent my career decarcerating, challenging power, and I have a vision for how we're gonna do it. I have actual experience decarcerating. When we started the closed Rikers campaign, there were 10,000 New Yorkers in Rikers Island. Today, there are fewer than 5,000. After the closed Rikers campaign, I went to St. Louis and worked with Ferguson activists to close the worst jail in America the workhouse. It is slated for closure this year. At the ACLU, I worked to close prisons, pass bail reform, and change criminal justice systems across the country. I have management experience. I've helped build an organization. I've run a 50-state operation, and I've managed teams at the city and state level involved investigating police misconduct and political corruption. And finally, I've got the vision. We take these plans seriously because we do want to be ready on day one. We're the only campaign with a restorative justice plan. We're the only campaign that's talking about ending the war on drugs by abolishing the Office of Special Narcotics Prosecutor. These are real differences we can make in people's lives by having a transformational view of how the system can be different. I thank you for your time and I thank you especially Chelsea Reform Democrats and Hell's Kitchen Democrats, both clubs that were born out of challenging the old way of thinking, 160 years ago, 140 years ago. If you want things to be done differently, go with someone with a new vision and new ideas. Thank you. And that's a wrap up for tonight, folks. Thank you very much to CRDC and my colleagues at Chelsea Reform Democratic Club and the president and co-leaders over at Hell's Kitchen. I thank you all for coming. Have a great night and be safe.